One day in one verse, Jesus described everyone in the world that will go to heaven. And then he goes on in the five previous verses to describe everyone in the world who will not. I'd like to focus on those who will. Because we need to reflect on his descriptions. Jesus said words, the ones we're about to read, as a warning for some. He says, watch out. The direction of your life is hellbound. And to others, he said, I'm encouraging you. The direction of your life is heavenward. All in one little passage, he does this. So what does he say in this description? Jesus says that a heart that remains trampled, hardened against God, a heart that remains shallow with an underlying rock of whatever rebellion or hardness against God there is, an unwillingness to yield to him, or whatever heart is crowded and never with the rocks and the weeds taken out supernaturally by God. He says those hearts will not enjoy the pleasures of God forever. And to those, he says, beware. Jesus goes on to describe everyone in the planet that will be enjoying heaven forever as being good. Just as there are three types of lost, hellbound people, the trampled, the shallow, the crowded, so there are three types of heaven-bound people, the 30, the 60, and the 100 fold return on God's investment in their lives. Among the good, God says that there are those who are the basic, I mean, they are performing, responding, having fruit in their life that he says 30-fold. But then there are those that are even more of their life, of the field of their heart, producing fruit for the Lord. And then there are some that, that are amazing in the hundredfold. Well, if you've just thought through what I've said, and you went, oh, good, I've done that. I don't need to worry. I've done that. You know, I've prayed or I've gotten saved, joined the church, whatever, in your mind. If you comfortably say, I've done that, then I, I want you to really listen to Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't say that you have done something that makes you good enough to get to heaven. You can't pray something to make you good enough. You can't do something. You can't, as my friend yesterday said, I was baptized. And he says, my baptism saved me. I said, your, your baptism saved you. He said, yes. I said, really? I said, it's not what you have done. It's what God has done. Has God made you good on the inside? Has he given you a new heart and taken away the trampled heart, the shallow heart, the heart that is crowded? So now it's a good heart. Because it's not those who have done something... Salvation is not something you can do. It's something that only God can do in us. And that's what Jesus is explaining. And that's what we're going to see this morning. Because one day Jesus compared life to a field. And he compared his word to seed. And he compared people to types of soil. And he compared eternal life to those who bring a crop to full harvest of righteousness. Interesting. Taken at face value, the message of this parable we're going to read is very clear. There are four soils, but only one of the four is good. Only one. Only one produces the harvest the farmer intended. Only one brings about the will of the one who sowed the seed. And the one who was sowing the seed of the word of God is the Lord himself through us, through various means. But the seed is God's word and the one in this parable who's the sower is Jesus Christ himself. So only one of the four soils brought about what the farmer wanted and that's the one that's good. This soil pictures a believer, and we'll see what the good heart looks like. The weedy soil and the shallow soil are those who pretend to believe. Maybe for a long time, but they're just pretenders. And the soil by the wayside is the absolute rejecter. They are trampled, hardened, and uninterested in God. But the soil that receives the seed 
and that produces the harvest that the seed brings when it's implanted in the soil is the good soil. There are many ways to look at how God classifies us, but we know the basics from his other parables. The harvest from the life is only because the heart was good. This seed only sprouted and grew and came to harvest in the good soil because the soil was good. And the soil of our heart is only changeable not by ourselves and not by being in church and not by being baptized at any church, but by God doing a supernatural change. And I think all the way through these verses I read, you should be asking yourself, has God done this in my heart? Not have I done something. You shouldn't say, I did that. Has God begun a good work in your heart? Has God supernaturally begun to change you by giving you a brand new operating system, a new heart? And have you begun to change from the inside out? Well, goodness only comes from God. No amount of effort can make a heart good. Fruit always comes from a good heart. A good soil is what Jesus is telling us. And that fruit harvest is different. Not every believer is the same. And I'm glad Jesus said that because it would be pretty hard to try and keep up with some people in their pursuit of God. But Jesus Christ accepts. He doesn't say those are bad that are the 30s and these are better that are the 60s. He just said a fact that there are some that, that totally devote themselves to bearing fruit for God. And there's some that less than that. And there's some that... God is present. And I'm glad that there are all those that are welcome in his family. But the most important question you'll ever answer is the question, has God ever made me good? No, not are you trying hard to be good. No, have you done some good things? Because bad people can always do good things. In fact, some of the kinder people I know that that are, are very, very sensitive and giving are my unsaved neighbors. I mean, they almost look for things to do for us. But you know what? It's no amount of good you and I can do that saves us. It's God making us good on the inside. And that's what Jesus is showing us. Either we are good or evil at the center of our being. We were born not innocent, but evil. We don't get polluted by our world as much as we pollute the world we're in. And so are you good? Only God is good. And only those born of God are good from the inside out. The great Bible teacher who I admire deeply, a man who said about, he said, I want to understand every verse of the Bible and I want to teach through every verse of the Bible. And you know what? The older he gets, I keep holding my breath. Is he going to make it? But many of you know him. His name is Warren Wearsby. And, and I, I love reading what, what he says on things because he always looks at it from the whole Bible perspective. This is what he said. One paragraph, he distilled down this whole 20-verse parable of Christ. He says this, it's important to note that none of the first three hearts, the wayside, the shallow, or the weedy, underwent salvation. The proof, Wearsby says, of salvation is not listening to the word, not whether you had an emotional response to church or the word or to worship, or even if you've ever cultivated the word so it grows in your life, kind of like you're in the Bible study and you love, you know, digging stuff out. That's not, as Wearsby says, the explanation. The proof of salvation is fruit. Why? Because Jesus over and over reminded us that you will know them by their fruit. Matthew 7, 16, for example, he says you will know them by their fruit. You will know what's on the inside by what the harvest is of their life. Well, let's read this. Luke chapter 8, and I'm going to read starting in verse 5. And the reason I'm reading Luke is it's a It's a different take on the same story, and I love some of the words that Luke captures. Starting in verse 5. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And it was trampled down. That's the trampled heart. Trampled down. And the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. There wasn't water present. Verse 7, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground. There's the good. Sprang up and yielded a crop a hundredfold. 
When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples said to him, saying, What doth this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not hear and understand. Verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear... Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Fascinating. Takes the word out of their hearts. Never got implanted. See, that one is so clear. But the ones in the rock are those, verse 13, who when they hear receive the word with joy. And these have no root. Who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. Now it's interesting, the word fall away is the word that's used all the rest of the time in the Bible for apostasy. Someone who denies the Lord and never turns back from it. So that is a likewise terminal condition. Verse 14, now the ones that fell among thorns are those who when they have heard go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life. And bring no fruit to maturity. Now that, we might think that the apple didn't quite turn red. No, it's not that. It's, it's they do not produce a harvest, literally is what it says. So there is no fruit. It's not like it's just an almost there. It just never was produced. When it says to maturity means it didn't even uh, produce it. But then, in verse 15, But the ones that fell on the good ground... Are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, I pray that you would bless to our hearts your word. That you would not let it come into our hearts and then get taken away. That you would not let it come into our hearts and then find no moisture. That we wouldn't let it into our hearts and then choke it to death, but rather that we would be that good and noble soil, that good and noble heart that responds to the work that you want to do within us, implanting your word and transforming us and regenerating us and saving us that we might bear the harvest of righteousness that you seek, that we might do your will. Oh, Lord, speak to our hearts for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This, this passage is so rich that I decided, and let's turn back to, to Mark chapter 4, because that's actually the one I want to take apart with you. And we're going to start in verse 4. And I'm going to give you a successive, uh, we're, we're going to stay within this passage this morning. N- next time, we're going to look at the wider good heart and the fruitful heart. I just want to take apart the, the whole passage, because what we can see in, in Mark 4 is, From both the negative illustrations as well as the positive illustration, we can see a composite of what a good heart looks like. Jesus gives us much more sometimes than we realize if we if we read slowly and and dig through. So first of all, in verse four, it says in Mark four four, now it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside. And the birds came and devoured it. Now, I already told you what Luke said. And the reason we start with Luke was, I want to emphasize this. Luke says that when he sowed, it was trampled down. Trampled down. The first truth I see in God's word this morning that Jesus is telling us is a good heart doesn't stay trampled down. What was the trampling? Remember, we, many weeks ago we looked at this and, and it was all the same soil. It's just some of the soil had been designated as the road. And so innumerable ox carts had gone down that road. Innumerable different animals had gone down that road. Innumerable people had trampled down that road. And through the rain and the trampling and the sun baking it, it had become as hard as blacktop or McAdam or or concrete or whatever you want to call it. It was like a road. And you know what? To one degree or another, all of us get trampled by life and sin. But the thing that Jesus points out is good hearts never stay trampled. You say, why are you bringing that out? Because Jesus did not tell this story to indict the multitude. He says in verse 9, listen to me. 
If you're being trampled by sin, why don't you say, I don't want to be trampled by sin? He was offering salvation. See, God so loved that he gave, that he offered. That he, in his great love, is not willing that any should perish. That's why he offered this message. He says, good hearts never stay trampled. You say, what, what does that look like? Well, let me show you some of Jesus' trampling stuff. Turn back, keep your finger here, and look at Matthew chapter 5. He liked this trample idea a lot and warned about it. Matthew 5 and verse 13. I'm going to just show you a couple of verses in Matthew. Don't lose Mark. We'll be right there. Matthew five thirteen. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how is it to be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So, so he implies the fact that there is to be a power in our lives when he is present. But if we allow into our lives sin and lose, it kind of negates and it kind of it, grieving the Holy Spirit causes us to be no longer influencing those around us. He says, then, then you have become in the condition of being trampled. And it's good for nothing to be cast out and trampled underfoot. Now there is a negative side of this. He says, believers persevere and never lose their saltiness. But there is a time, and I know, I've been in the ministry long enough to see good and godly people go through periods of their life when they do crazy things. When they, when they choose to sin in ways that, that totally short-circuit their lives, their families, their marriages, many of those come back. Sadly, some do not, which shows they were never in Christ. But those who come back show that they do not allow themselves to continue in this trampled down state. Now, why do they come back? Because, of course, the Lord chastens them. And Hebrews 12 says that no one that's born again can persist in sin without the chastening of the Lord. But when the Lord chastens you and you come back, it doesn't take away the fact that your life was trampled by sin for that time period. So Jesus says, don't let that happen. But look at chapter 7 and verse 6. Jesus told many, many stories about this trampling idea. Look at chapter 7 and verse 6. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, Matthew 7, 6, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. There the trampling is clearly the pigs. They have never received. They are the tramplers. They trample underfoot the, the good things of God, the gospel. This is a picture of this trampled soil. And Jesus is saying those are the ones who, who take the pearls and, and of the things of God and they trample them underfoot. And, and it's a very vivid picture of those pearls on the ground. I can just see the pigs going by. And Jesus says there, those are the trample, tramplers and the trampled soil is trampled by sin. And those people are far from God. But he says, don't persist in that. Uh, here's one more I'll read to you. You go back to chapter 4 of Mark's gospel. And I want to read to you one because here's a sobering word the writer of Hebrews gave in chapter 10. He said this, Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? The writer of Hebrews puts several severe warnings through this book of those who come right up to the fence, those who come right up into the church, those who come right up and stare Christ in the face, and they look long and hard at him, and they're enlightened, and they begin tasting of the things of God, and then they come to a point where they turn away. Now, these are some of the most difficult to understand people in the Bible. All of these come under the heading of the apostates, those who come right up to the things of God. And look him clear, right in the face. It reminds me so much of Judas. Judas came up in the dark with a torch in the Garden of Gethsemane until he found Jesus. And he looked him right in the eye and Jesus spoke to him and said, Friend, whom are you seeking? Who do you want? He looked right at him. Friend. And Judas kissed him and then went out into the darkness. And you know his ending. There are people that seemingly do that. They come and they seemingly become good soil. They seemingly become participants of Christ. And then they turn and they trample him underfoot. You know what Jesus is saying? Don't do that. Don't do that. You know what the message of Hebrews is? Anybody that does that never comes back. That 
in biblical vernacular, if you look at all 1,189 chapters of the Bible, it means they were never born again because anybody born of God never dies. They never perish. They never turn. Why? Because God keeps them. And we'll see that in a moment. This is a warning. Don't trample the things of God. Don't come close. Stare Christ in the face and go through all the motions and then someday say, I don't believe that and turn because you'll never turn back. I've seen that too. I remember early on in my ministry, I was a youth evangelist and I used to, uh, I used to have the best stories, kept people just holding on to their chairs. And I remember that I would watch people and they would time after time come to the meetings and they would, during the invitation song, actually you could see them and, and they would hold on to the pew in front of them. And you know, if you hold long enough, if you're close enough, you'll see my knuckles will turn white and I could see that. They'd hold on like this. And you know what? They, I would look them in the eye and I'd say, you know, today the Bible says if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. And I even used to, I don't do that here because the platform's so high, but I used to actually walk down the aisle. How would you like that? Wouldn't you get a little nervous if I was walking down the aisle during the message and look you right in the eye? I mean, and, and, uh, and make a point and look right at you when I made it, and you would, uh, just like the lady I just looked at, she blinked, you know, are you looking at me? That's a very provocative way. And I remember I would walk to the back and talk while the white knuckles were going. And they would, yeah, they knew I was talking to them, and they'd go, No. I'm not interested. You know, it's interesting. A week or a month later, the same ones would be in the meeting. No white knuckles. They were totally detached, disinterested. And a lot of times they they would fade out and you'd never see them again. They had come to the point where they said no to God. He says, don't do that. Well, look back in chapter 4 of Mark's Gospel, verse 6, because here's the second thing. Good hearts, number one, never stay trampled. Sin might might trample them, but they get they get chastened by the Lord. They get convicted of their sin. And they, they, like Peter, they say, I am sorry. And they come back and they are restored to the Lord. They never stay trampled. That's one of the evidences of salvation. Second thing, look at chapter 4, verse 6. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. Because it had no root, it withered away. The second truth about a good heart, a born-again believer, someone that's saved is, they never thirst. They never lack moisture. You notice it says here, it was scorched. It had no root. It didn't have water. And you say, what's the point of that? Well, the point is that was one of the biggest things that Jesus said. Let me show you for just a moment. Go to the gospel by John. Uh, But look at chapter 4 of Mark's gospel in verse 14, because Jesus said never seven times in the gospel by John. Now, whenever there's a seven, it's a complete set. And, and Jesus wanted to know things that will never happen. Now, if Jesus says it will never happen, I'd listen because he knows what he's talking about. And if Jesus says, if you have me in your life, this will never happen to you. Ooh, may. Two little Greek words. We translate with one English word, never. He said, this will never happen. Here's the first one. Look at John 4 and verse 14. Whoever drinks of the water, I shall give him. Not water he produces. See, there's a difference between I did that and God did that. See, salvation is of the Lord. If you're saved, God did it. It isn't that, and that's why you have to be, some people are so, they pray a prayer 53 different ways. They're hoping they say the right set of words. There's no incantation. There's no magical formula. There's no specific order of words you have to say. It is whether or not you come to him, seeking what only he can give. Nothing attached of your own goodness, realizing your need of it, your lostness and my lostness. See, and that's why there are, there's never any two gospel presentations exactly the same in the scriptures. I think it's intentional. But Jesus said, those who come to me and drink the water I can give, so it's exclusive. I'm the only distributor, Jesus said. Look at the next three words. Will never thirst. You know what that soil I just read to you in Mark 4, 6? It thirsted. It got scorched. The evidence that there was no life of God was that it got scorched, that it died, that it withered away, that it was gone. Because Jesus said in John 4, 14, Whoever drinks of the living water that I give him will never thirst, but the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water. That's another bad thing about 
and I'm hearkening back to my good old days as a, a Baptist minister growing up in, in, in all the, the church that I grew up in that I was ordained in. We used to have testimony. Every month we had testimony night. I can still hear those testimonies. The same people would say the same thing. Fifty-seven years ago, I walked the aisle. I'd say, uh-huh. 50, has anything happened since then? Couldn't get a thing out of them. I mean, I didn't see any joy, I didn't see any peace, didn't see any hunger, didn't see any growth. But 57 years ago, they walked the aisle. What happened to the rest of verse 14? But the water I shall uh, give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. It's not what you did in the past, it's whether or not God is present in your life now, in the present. It's a past event that continues to the present and will continue to the end. See, that's what salvation is all about. He that began a good work in you will perfect you to the day of salvation. Of, there's a future event of salvation when we are out of the presence of sin and away from the power of sin and we are never to sin again in his presence. But he said there is this water and you'll never thirst. Look at chapter 6. A lot of nevers in John's gospel. That's the first one. I'll show you all seven of them. Okay, chapter 6 and verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life, and he who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me, here's another one, shall never thirst. There's two in that verse. Shall never hunger, shall never thirst. Now, what happened in the parable of the sower? No water, no moisture. That plant got scorched. Yes, something happened. And it's, it, you know, it, it's amazing how hard it is to understand how people can seemingly come under the influence of the gospel and just by being around the word of God, they kind of get excited about it and they, they get enthusiastic and they start talking like we talk and everything. But there is no continuation in their lives. And when the sun comes up, they get scorched. They get choked. They perish. Look at the next one in John's Gospel. Number four is in chapter 8, verse 51. I have all these marked in my Bible. And I think a lot of you do in yours. Chapter 8, it says this in verse 51. Most assuredly, I say unto you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. There's another one. Verse 52, and the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon, Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Never. Never. Never perish. Never die. Never thirst. Never hunger. Jesus was very adamant about these, very absolute. Keep going to chapter 10, verse 28. Here's, here's another one. Chapter 10, verse 28. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hands. They shall not be snatched. They will not, as, as in the popular vernacular of religious world today, they shall not lose their salvation. That is used for someone getting pulled away and, and, and taken away and swept away and they lose their salvation. Jesus said, they will never be snatched out of my hand. They can't lose what I give them. They cannot lose what I began. See, that's, people that lose their salvation are the ones that did it themselves. And then they lose it. Because they did it. Jesus said, if I do it, you'll never lose it. You'll never get snatched. You'll never perish. You'll never thirst. You'll never hunger. Finally, I love this one. Look at John 11 and verse 26. It's the last one. 11.26, whoever lives, that's present tense, believes, that's present tense, in me shall never die. And I love the evangelist that Christ was coming out. Look at, well, look at what he says after that. This is at a funeral, by the way. I mean, I love it. I always, this is my entree. Whenever I get to do a funeral, I always launch into the gospel for this reason. Jesus said, do you who are gathered at the graveside of your beloved friend Lazarus, do you believe that? Do you believe in me? If you are right this moment living and believing in me, he said, you will never die. The God of the universe unequivocally 
absolutely said, you'll never die. You will never perish, chapter 10, verse 28. You shall never see death, 851. You shall never thirst, 635b. You shall never hunger, 635a. You shall never thirst, John 414. Now, go back with me to Mark chapter 4 and look at verse 6. In light of Jesus Christ, who has so powerfully spoken, look what it says. Good hearts never thirst. Mark 4, 6. The sun was up and it was scorched. What it says in Luke, remember when we read it? It lacked moisture. Literally had no water. No water. The seed sprouted and started and died. Now, you use everything you know from the last five minutes. If Jesus said, the life I give never perishes, the life I give never thirsts, the life I give never dies, and whatever happened in chapter 4, verse 6, it died. So it wasn't from God. So the lesson is good hearts never thirst. Good hearts never die. Look at verse 7. In some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. Choked it. Now, for some of you, you wonder, you say, oh, what if that just means, you know, I've been choked and I didn't die, right? Have you ever been choked, ever had someone come up, you know, and uh, what happens to me is the the kids ride on my back and they wrap, you ever had them wrap their arms around your neck and they start leaning back and you go, oh, you know, you're about ready to, I've been choked like that. That's not this word choke, okay? Keep your finger here and go to Luke with me again, because I want to show you. The Bible always explains the Bible. You don't need five commentaries and three dictionaries. You can make it with just the Bible. Look at where we were in Luke chapter 8. And it says this, that, that in verse 14, Now the ones that fell among thorns are those when they heard go out and are, what's the word there in 14? Choked, okay? Now, What kind of choking is that? Well, the blessing is that the Spirit of God, inspiring the authors to write, was engineering, and he knew that sometime a group of people would be reading this and say, I wonder if that means that the word died, it was choked, and so there's no life there, or if that just means the kids had their arms around your neck and they temporarily choked you a little bit. You know, and so this person's really a believer, right? Well, look at verse 33. Because the same word is used right here in verse 33, only it's translated drowned. But it's the very same word. Luke 8, verse 33. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place to the lake and choked. Now, how do you take that? Do you think those pigs were all blowing water out and swimming their hardest back to shore and, <laughs> and finally resuscitated? Mm-mm. How do you take Luke 8, 33? They're dead. They're at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, right? And, and what the scripture says is, look back, go back to Mark chapter 4 and look at verse 7. And some seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, killed it drowned it. Now, in Luke's account, the word choke is used right after in the sower message to describe the pigs that were drowned. And this is what I wrote. God's word can never be drowned from the life of a believer like demons drowned pigs. Okay? God's word will never perish. The life God gives you in your heart will never perish. It will never die. It will never get choked. Now, we do go through times of the kids on our back with sin. And sometimes we allow something into our life that temporarily chokes us, doesn't kill us, grieves the Holy Spirit, it it renders us powerless, makes us feel cold, makes us feel distant, makes us feel unsaved. In fact, that's a good thing. When believers act like unbelievers, they don't feel like believers. Praise the Lord. The problem is when people say they're believers and act like unbelievers and it doesn't bother them. 
In fact, one of the greatest evidences of salvation is being convicted of sin and grieved of the sin in your life and hating it and wanting to turn from it. And that's why Jesus told this story. He said, if your life is getting trampled, don't let it be. And if you think you're a believer, then you should not allow that to go on in your life. And if your life is shallow and if there are areas in your life that you're resisting God, then stop, as the writer Isaiah says, and allow God to come in and change you. And as the minor prophets say, let God break up the hardened ground. Jesus was warning. Good hearts never stay trampled. Good hearts never die, never thirst. And here's why. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 of chapter 4 of Mark. Here's the next one. Good hearts... The reason they never die, they never perish, they never thirst is that they are implanted with the word of God. Mark 4.15 And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. And when they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that which was sown in their hearts. An unbeliever can have the word taken out of their hearts by Satan. Why? Because it was never implanted. Here's the last verse I want you to turn to. We're going to be done turning. Go to James. That's all the way to the right. Uh, you go through the Gospels and Romans and Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. There it is. Chapter 1. Okay, little James, chapter 1. I want you to ask yourself the question that James posits for us here. Because good hearts are implanted. Good hearts don't have the word taken away. Why is that? Is it because they're holding on for dear life? Is it because uh, they put a stake down, they prayed the right prayer five times, and they wrote it in their Bible that they prayed it? No. No. It's not that. It's God has begun something in them. And look what it says in James 1.21. And I love the order of this. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. How does God save us? God implants his word into our hearts. Has God ever done that in your life? Are you good because God's implanted his word? Are you good because he has begun a good work in you? Are you good because a new heart he has given you and a new spirit he has put within you? Because he has taken away the stony heart out of your flesh? Because he has caused you and me to want to obey him? Are you good? Or are you evil and trying your hardest to be good? If you're frustrated, if you're trying your hardest, if it never works, if it seems like you you take one step forward and 15 backward, and you never have the joy of the Lord, you never have the peace of God, you've never experienced the life of God inside, then maybe you should ask yourself, has he ever implanted his word and saved my soul? It's not what you've done. What you've said, what you've tried. Has God come into your life? Has God saved you? Has God changed you? Has God given you a new heart? Has God moved in? Has His Spirit taken residence? Because when the Spirit of God is in our heart, He cannot be dormant. When He's there, He starts radiating out His love. Now, when you get saved, when I got saved, I got all of God. What he's asking is for all of you. You see, the problem is we do not want him to control our lives. And we allow in places for the devil, as Ephesians 4 says. We allow the sins to to come in and to take root. And we allow that and it grieves and quenches the spirit of God within us. And we feel awful. If you've never received the implanted word, if the life of God has never begun, it can begin right now. You don't need anything from us. You need it all from the Lord. You want to hear some of the ways people got saved in the Bible? Here's one. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. There's one. Here's another one. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Here's another one. Repent and believe the gospel, and you will receive the remission of your sins. Here's another one. They that heard the message joyfully received the word. I mean, you can find a million ways of describing, or at least a few hundred. But all of them have something in common. God does it in the heart. What's our part? We, by faith, receive. We, by faith, call out. We, by faith, receive. We, by faith, seek. 
He said, you'll seek me and find me when you seek for me with all your heart. We find the one who is all the time looking for us. Have you responded to him? Has he knocked on your heart? The Bible says, while you hear him knocking, don't harden your heart. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. I'd like to ask you, have you received the implanted word that's able to save your soul? Are you good? If you're not good, would you like to be good? No one can be good except those who are born of God. And if you'd like to be born of God, the Lord says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord, I'll save. If you have never, for yourself, called on God to supernaturally change you from the inside out, you ought to do it. You ought to say, I've tried my hardest, I've done everything I can, I've pedaled my bike and I'm getting nowhere. I want you to begin a good work in me. I want your salvation. I want you to give me a new heart. The Lord says, he'll hear your voice. Even a bruised reed and a smoking flax, he'll not quench. That means even the most weakest seeking after him, if it genuinely comes from a heart of faith, he'll respond to. If you never responded, I'm not going to give you a prayer to prayer because then you'll think you got saved by saying what I said. You have to ask Jesus to save you. If you've never done that, why don't you do that right now? And if you're not experiencing the joy of that salvation, then why don't you ask the Lord to break up the hard ground in your life? If you're truly born again and you're not full of the joy of the Lord, then you've got hard ground, you've got some thorns, and you ask him to change those right now. Father in heaven, I pray that you would do your great work in hearts. We want to be good, but only you are good, and only you can make us good. And only those who are born from above have goodness produced by your spirit within. And you said that whoever wants that can have that if they will cry out in faith to you, God our Savior, to you, Christ, our sacrifice and our Redeemer, to you, Spirit of grace, who applies the sacrifice of Christ to our hearts. Lord, I pray that all who know you will know you better, more deeply, more yieldedly, and any who know you not, that today... You would draw them to yourself, that they would, by simple faith, cry out to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.